Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Mike Vinoy from Assure, and I want to thank you for joining today's webinar, HR and Payroll, Budgeting and Planning, Where to Invest for Growth and Success in 2021. So depending where you're sitting in this pandemic, uh, you might be just busting at the seams, uh, ready to throw the gas on 2021 uh, and really, really grow your business. Uh, there's, there's plenty of other folks that really are, are, are still going through real tough times. It depends where you're at geographically, uh, you know, uh, uh, what your industry is. There's a, there's a ton of factors, you know, clearly we've been saying all along in, our, in, in this weekly series, uh, you know, we're all in the same storm. We are not in the same boat. But, but I think regardless, you know, here we are in January. Today's inauguration, uh, yesterday's inauguration day. Um, you know, so regardless of where you are politically, we, we are entering a new chapter as a country, as an economy. Uh, you know, that, that we're still in the in, in the in the in the depth, I'd say, of, of this pandemic. But I think we all see uh, light at the end of the tunnel of this thing, right? So, you know, whether we're three months away or six months away, I, I think we all see see the light coming. And, and given the deep, deep, deep cuts so many of us have had to make in, in 2020, uh, I think we're poised for even if it's not back to normal, uh, that might be a 2022, 2023 scenario the year over year compare for growth is gonna be real. And from a payroll, HR benefits perspective, uh, we gotta plan for that. We gotta we got have a people plan, we gotta have a technology plan. So really excited for today's guest joining me today, uh, colleague and friend, uh, Ale Goldstein. Uh, Ale is uh, Assure's president, chief revenue officer, uh, but Ale spent, uh, what, 22, 23 years in, in the human capital management space uh, where he spent uh, a lot of time uh, uh, working at uh, uh, household names, ADP, Ceridian, Oracle, uh, uh, in different points of his career, uh, serving small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large large businesses, in senior VP uh, roles, spent the, about the last decade in executive management, uh, uh, chief revenue officer, pr president role. So, so Ale brings us, I think, really unique experience in, in, in uh, a look at this that he's uh, worked with small and medium-sized businesses. He knows what the, the culture is there and how tough and hand-to-mouth those businesses are from a cash standpoint, but also has spent time in corporate America, so also knows what pretty, pretty rigorous formal budgeting process looks like uh, in, in you know, 20 years of that, all in, all in payroll HR, human capital management. So, uh, Ale, welcome. Really looking forward to today's conversation. Yeah, thank you, Mike, and, and really excited to, to be a part of the conversation today. Thank you. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, today's, today's conversation, we're going to be unpacking our, our, our most recent ebook uh, of the same title, HR and Payroll, Budgeting and Planning. So if you hop on our website, hrassuresoftware.com uh, forward slash ebook, HR, Payroll, Planning and Budgeting, uh, you don't have to remember the URL, just hop on the website, uh, go up to the uh, main menu and under resources and, and you'll find it real quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to unpack the, the, the big themes here. We're going to put up some color commentary around this. I encourage you to download it now. You can follow along. You can highlight some spots you want to come back to. Uh, in either case, uh, this conversation can stand alone. That ebook can stand alone. Uh, we're also going to be recording this uh, session. So if you got anybody else you want to share this information uh, you know, a friend, a colleague, or somebody in your organization as you begin to plan for 2021, uh, uh, this is a, a, an available resource for you. So if you want to follow along, great. If you if you want to just uh, sit back and listen, that, that's also great. But I think the first topic we're going to take is, is really just the concept uh, 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 by itself, right? So for planning for growth, um, you know, the, uh, the, the gr growth is a weird thing, uh, and I think in 2021, because uh, a lot of it is going to be people growing, but really just because the, the year over year compare is so terrible, right? I mean, Q3 quarter over quarter was 33% growth. I think that's an all time record GDP growth record, but it's because Q2 is so terrible, right? Um, but there's some really interesting things, Ale. I'd, I'd like to get your insight on whether it's the 33% GDP growth in Q3 or the 77% uh, increase in, in new uh, federal ID applications. Uh, there are some really telling signs of what's around the corner here. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and I think what's, what's really interesting is when you look at the new business formations today and in and, and yes, we are what I would say coming towards the, 
you know, the light at the end of the tunnel with, with the vaccine and more clarity around uh, a new administration and, and a go forward plan as a country. Um, but ultimately you're seeing the underpinnings of that in small business, right? And, and yes, for public companies, uh, you know, the year over year comparisons are gonna be massive when you think about the growth and, and really the, the trough that happened in, in March, April of last year. So, so those are predetermined and, and, and I think we're seeing it in the stock market, which is a, you know, a, a predicts pretty much six months out and, and is, a, is a view of uh, the economy or these companies, public companies, six months out. But what's really interesting is the private business formation. And when you think about the number of uh, entities and federal IDs that are starting to be formed, uh, it's massive. And, and it's in numbers that we really haven't ever seen before. So you do have uh, what I think is a, a groundswell that's starting with these formations that, that I think is, is really telling of what's to come. And, and, and it's all gonna be around small business. So a massive opportunity you know, coming out of uh, a once in a hundred year uh, event like the pandemic. So, so you know, for 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 those people who are, you know, they're they're still deep in the throes of this. If they're like, uh, okay, I'm I'm listening today, but I'm still in survival mode. Uh, you know, speak to them. How should they be thinking about this balance between I'm still I'm just trying to survive the day, the week. How do, how do I make next week's payroll? Uh, uh, when I can't let customers in my door, how, how do we? How should those people be thinking about still planning for growth, and why is that important? You know, you know, again, it, it's really interesting, right? When when you think about timing and how you anticipate growth and how you plan for growth, right? Uh, if if you're waiting for all of your competitors uh, to be growing for you to start investing in growth, you, you probably have missed. Uh, a big portion of that growth curve or your opportunity to take market share uh, as growth really starts again. And so it really is about level setting. Hey, you know, planning for, look, today, this is what I need current state. But if I look three months out, six months out, nine months out, 12 months out, where do you want the business to be? And if you really start unpacking it and viewing it in a, in a forward looking manner like that and plan for that, well, maybe you're not in, maybe you're not investing directly today because you're really trying to hunker down and stabilize and ensure you're, uh, uh, you maintain and stay in business. But ultimately, maybe it's next month where that first incremental dollar goes back into the business uh, for some sort of growth. Um, Maybe it's it's 60 days out. Maybe it's a, a ramp of an extra, you know, extra incremental uh, funds in the next 30 days and then increasing it in 60 days and then increasing it even more in 90 days. So I, I think planning for growth is the key here, right? And, and understanding where you're at today is not where you want to be 90 days from now, six months from now, a year from now. And so what is that investment in that in that timeline or that horizon that you start making those incremental investments again back into the business? So, so I want to reserve a couple of these questions for, for upcoming, but like, you know, your last decade of your career, you're, you're doing budgeting at a pretty sophisticated level working for publicly traded companies and talking about millions and tens and hundreds of millions of dollars but uh, i really want to get uh, get kind of granular and maybe not granular but just practical for the small business owner but but before we go there i just want to touch on uh, it and it's the second bullet here about human capital being more than a cost center and, and indulge me for a second i'm just going to read a quote uh out of the ebook and, and this is cited from from the uh, hr consulting uh, organization really respect these guys over at corn ferry it says globally human capital just people, labor, and knowledge will be worth as much as $1.2 quadrillion over the next five years. In contrast, physical capital, which is inventory, real estate, and technology, will be worth an estimated $521 trillion. So human talent and intelligence is worth 2.3 times as much, 2.3x more valuable than everything else put together. So 
that sounds like one of those things if you're at a big company you can kind of get behind and think about your talent strategy make how do we make that real for the small business owner with 17 employees uh, uh, to, to think about human capital as an asset versus uh, just, hey, this is my staff, these are my employees, uh, it, it, and really getting the most value from that asset versus you know, traditional capital? Well, it's, a, it's a great question, and, and, I, and I think it's relative to the size of the company, but, but it really is down to even if you have one or two employees, uh, you're a sole proprietor, and maybe you have a couple people working for you. Ultimately, if you take a step back and think about how hard is it to find really good skilled employees, right? No matter what size you are, if you're your two employee shop or or your you, you know uh, uh, hundred couple hundred thousand employees, right or whatever. But but ultimately it's the same thing there there's a there's a shortage of skilled workers out there it continues to grow and it is across every single industry uh, in this country and frankly worldwide is what we're seeing now and so when you think about how hard it is for you to find some of these employees and keep these employees well ultimately you got to have a plan for what you do to to continue to invest in in those people right because because it is so hard to attract that talent and keep them i think people are really taking a step back and saying okay well how do i give more to my employees and invest in my employees so they want to be a part of uh, our growth or or our trajectory as an organization and, and i think that that runs the gamut i talk to small business owners every single day uh, and, and their biggest concern and their biggest challenge is, I, I just need to find good people. If, if I could find good people, I believe in the strategy of our company. I believe in, in the objectives of the company. I believe in the addressable market or, or opportunity of the company I built. But I really just need good people and I need to be able to hold on to them. <clears throat> yeah, and, and we'll, we'll have this recurring theme. We talk about this all the time here. Uh, it's it's not just a butt in a seat. It's not just a, a, an FTE, a full time equivalent headcount, right? That this is we're talking about talent, right? So certainly there's a minimum requirement around uh, you know butts and seats that you just got to perform the minimum acceptable uh, level. But this is you know I was joking with one of our colleagues the other day that you know it's a uh, you know, and con contemplating how to do a job, you know, more cost effectively and, you know, uh, whether it's engineering and development or call centers or whatever, you know, what's, uh, how, how much is it, would it cost you to, to outsource and offshore uh, some things? And the question comes up, you know, how, how, many, how many offshore composers would it take to write Beethoven's Fifth? And the answer is there is no number, right? There was only one human that could do it. And that's, that's talent. So when you have when you have the right people with the right skills, with the right passion that are aligned culturally, uh, the productivity is just, it's exponentially more than just a, a headcount game. Can you, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, do, uh, do more with less, right? I mean, we see it all the time on how much productivity and, and it's almost back to this 80 20 rule right and and you you across every business across every department and every discipline uh it's obvious that that you get uh a lot more productivity out of your high producers and in and um in in it's very evident uh, that there's a gap between, you know, having so many or having enough of those high producers, right? And so, you know, being able to keep those folks and, and keep them engaged and, and invest in those folks, it, it's mission critical to the business, right? And, and I think um, investing across the board in, in those folks and those skilled workers, I think is, um, it's the key to success today, and, and we're seeing it across all industries. All right, very good. Let, so let, let's let's bring that, make this a little more real for folks, and bring this down to like a, a budget. And how do you budget for uh, human capital management? And, and it might sound like a buzz phrase for big companies, but really, it, it, it's a mindset, right? Human capital management. Human capital is your people, and then how do you how do you manage that? So 
the applications that we're all used to are like payroll and, and HR and benefits administration and recruiting applications. But, but all these kind of fit into this, you know, human capital. How, how do you better manage that human capital? Um, talk to the, to the folks about what we see, what you, what you see about kind of the common approaches to incremental budgeting and zero based, you know, maybe, maybe some pros and cons of each. And then, uh, you know, what, what would be our guidance for our clients and our and small business owners out there to be thinking about a budgeting process? Yeah, I mean, well, I guess from a guidance standpoint, number one in, in, in the uh, quote on the bottom or the data point on the bottom is, is, is the most critical piece, right? When, when three out of four uh, business owners, small business owners are not creating an official budget, it, it's troubling, right? And so number one, create a budget. Yes, there are absolutely different types of budgets and, and we're gonna hit on really a couple that, that are, uh, I would say the, the most obvious ones or the ones that are most widely used. But at the end of the day, create a budget. And, and you don't have to go to business school to create a budget. You know, you, you run a business, uh, you know what it takes to uh, bring money in, uh, you're writing the checks for all the money that's coming out, uh, you know what your expenses are, right? And, and so ultimately just create that budget, whatever it is. That's the first thing that I would suggest is mission critical uh, to the plan. And, and then let's talk a little bit about the two types of most commonly used budgets, right? Ultimately incremental budgeting has been used across the gamut, small business, mid-sized companies, enterprise or large corporations. And really that is taking the run rate or whatever budget that you've had in the prior year, or prior quarter, and then incrementally adjusting it up or down based on your plan, based on the strategy and your plan for growth of your organization. Zero-based budgeting is really starting from scratch, right? And, and so starting from zero uh, and creating a budget um, from scratch. Where are you going to invest? Where is that revenue coming in from? Uh, where are you going to be spending all the dollars coming in? Uh, and, and ultimately, where is that investment into people is a big chunk of that. In today's environment, uh, I'm seeing a lot more zero-based budgeting from our small business owners uh, and entrepreneurs. And, and that's really because COVID uh, was a reset. It, it, it changed the game. It reset a lot of the strategies of small businesses worldwide. And so it really gave an opportunity for entrepreneurs to say, I'm going to start from zero. And I'm going to really, really take a hard look at every single dollar that I'm investing or putting into or spending in this business. And I think it's a really healthy approach to go through zero-based budgeting because, because your priorities change. And we saw that in 2020 in a very big way. And folks had to shift and folks had to pivot uh, and folks had to change their business model in many cases. And so what you spent on certain things and certain aspects of the business changed dramatically uh, March of last year. So zero-based budgeting is, I would say, probably uh, the latest, what we're seeing the most of. Um, but ultimately, if there's businesses that have been stable or fortunate enough, fortunate enough to be stable through COVID and, and maybe accelerate growth, they might be looking at a starting mm -hmm. point of incremental, um, which, which we're seeing some of. But, but the primarily zero-based budgeting in this type of environment. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I so completely agree. And I think maybe I, I, want, I want to stick on this topic for a little bit because I, I, I want to make sure that, that you know, th this is not just, uh, okay, here's my business. I got a, I got a, sale, a sales and marketing function. I've got a, a, a product, you know, manufacturing or purchasing function uh, in, in looking at my traditional departments and saying, okay, do I really, and then, and then just sharpening your pencil, so to speak, to how do I drive cost out of that model? I think zero-based budgeting kind of begs the question in, in, in the pandemic, obviously did this for some industries, you know, think about restaurants and, and, and having to go to takeout only in, in so many cases. 
is let zero based budgeting be the thing that just challenges the business model period right so you you might you might make widgets and provide them to customers in an industry and that part might be consistent but if you've been in business for 10 or 20 years you probably have a lot of legacy process and go to market strategy baked into your day to day if you were going to start that exact same business over today would you really build everything the same would you have the exact same number of salespeople and the exact same number of marketing people would you have the exact same office structure would you have the exact same uh you know uh, uh, square footage of real estate to accommodate people talk talk about how to challenge how small business owners can and should be challenging the business model not just uh an expense side of a budget no, I, I think, yeah, that's really, really important because I think what we've seen, you know, over the last 12 months is um, you have got to evolve as an organization and in and a lot of whether it's, you know, you're in the, the hospitality business and the food business and you really had to shift to delivery and takeout model. And so your cost structure changed in a very big way. Uh, whether you were a retail, small business retail uh, organization and, and you had to ship from, you know, brick and mortar to a website and digital sales. Uh, again, these are massive evolution and transformation of organizations. And, and folks have done really well, the folks that, that have been nimble and, and that have been able to evolve and change that. Now, there's a lot of companies that are looking at those model and, and are following suit now, right? Now that they see where uh, where the business needs to go in this in this new type of environment. But I, but I would say you know a few things when you think about challenging. Well, the first thing is for me is you know you've got to make sure that you also understand some of the benchmarks in the industry. So so who are your competitors and how are they spending and, and how are they going to market? I think that's really important to level set as you create some of these budgets. Uh, and, and then ultimately, you know, it's a living, breathing document. And so, so you gotta revisit this thing, uh, I would say every week, every month, every quarter religiously, because it does change. And, and I think this past year uh, taught us all a lesson of yeah, you, you really need to uh, continue to, uh, um, you really do need to continue to make sure it's a living, breathing document and, and that you adjust it accordingly based on the market and based on the macro environment. So uh, I think challenge, challenge the business uh, again, if you go back to zero based budgeting, you know, if you're writing it from scratch, you will challenge or you should be challenging every dollar that you're spending uh, at the same time, making sure that you're spending enough, right, to grow the business. Yeah, it, it, and, 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 and you're challenging not just the dollars per vendor, so to speak, but also how you're generating, the method in which you're generating the revenue uh, that that might have to change and that will fundamentally change the, the, the model. So let, let, so let's get really practical for, for folks. Let, it, it, you know, this might sound like really obvious intuitive stuff, but let's break down what we're calling kind of, you know, six steps, six tips for, for, for budgeting for small and mid-sized companies here. Uh, and I think the first one is obvious, you know, in times of uncertainty, cash is king, right? So can, can you just kind of walk us through uh, and, and a, there's a couple of these I probably want to spend some more time on, but just w walk us through how, how you see these these tips. Yeah, sure. So so cash flow is critical, right? And, and so you need to understand and, and obviously know what, what is the cash flow that's needed out of the business, right? And so, you know, if there's a cash flow number that's necessary, uh, it, it, you got to keep that in mind as you're thinking about where you're spending the dollars, right? We talked a little bit about benchmarks. It's really good to know, hey, I aspire uh, to be like this organization, or I know I'm very competitive with these organizations and, and the, this is what they're spending on, or, or, or these are the industry benchmarks for my type of industry, whether it's cash flow, margin, growth. Uh, it's really important because it helps level set and know, am I ahead of the curve? Am I behind the curve? Uh, and, and really, for, for the business owners that I speak to, uh, it, it gives them that North Star a lot of times of, of where they want to go. 
Uh, we talked about it being a living, breathing document. That's really important. This isn't something that you create once, uh, 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 put away in one of the files or the desk drawer, as they used to say, and, uh, and not look at it ever again. It's a living, breathing document. Uh, the more you look at it, adjust it, uh, the, the healthier and, and the more visibility you're going to have as a, as a business. Hey, um, um I want, to, I, want to, I want to stop. One thing I, for number two on, on benchmarks. That I, so I've always had this conflicting feeling on, on benchmarks. On one hand, I think it's really great to just have, to, to me, it, it's context, right? So it's like, okay, am I, am I just crazy here having this cost structure uh, uh, and, and it's a sanity check? But at the same time, I would really encourage folks, don't, don't view benchmarks as a target. You know, uh, if you are trying to reinvent an industry, if you're trying to be number one in a space, you might fundamentally think about things differently and therefore your cost structure might be different than your competitors, right? And that might be a really good thing, but but it's, it, it's a way to measure and get context to how the herd is performing versus you trying to carve out a new space, right? You got, you got thoughts on that, you know? No, I, I, I think you're right, Mike, and, and, and I guess for the innovators and, and, and the folks that, that have organizations that uh, have disrupted industries, you know, they might have looked at benchmarks of, okay, here, here's, here's the industry, but they might be seeing something there uh, from a disruption standpoint where they can be more profitable or they can go to market in a different way and 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 i i think that's a really good point you make as businesses evolve um and and disrupt current industries that that have maybe do have done business a certain way for a long time we're probably seeing that more than ever right now uh where benchmarks for certain industries are are being turned upside down uh, because of the environment and because of the disruption that's happening as a as a byproduct of it. And, and I just think about like a non-industry specific example. Like if you have if you have uh, uh, customers that are paying you and you got this recurring revenue stream from those customers, you could you could in, and maybe the benchmark is in your space is maybe a 50% gross margin, right? So uh, and that's just the standard. But but maybe you want you could say, hey, we're going to go into harvest mode. We're going to try to automate like crazy and our customers will, will still like it. They'll tolerate it. But uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to take my, my, my gross margin up a whole bunch and I'm going to harvest a bunch of cash. And this is what's going to make us separate. You're going to go the exact opposite direction. You can say, I'm going to throw more expense at this. I'm going to willingly uh, accept a lower gross margin on my, on my services but I'm gonna double the length of time customers stay with us because this extra level of service we provide makes them love us for life, right? So uh, I, I think there's a lot of ways to think about benchmarking is just that. It's, it's context, it grounds you, but that doesn't have to be your target. You still gotta come up with your own way to innovate. So, all right, I, I totally cut you off. I'll, I'll let you take us through the, uh, pick us back up at the expected, the unexpected, AKA a pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, it goes with number three, right? And so you're revisiting, you know, you should be revisiting the budget every month. And, and I think, again, we, we learn many of us uh, to expect the unexpected and, and why revisiting that budget and that business model is, is really important. Um, it's a once in a hundred year uh, pandemic. Uh, and, and I think there's not much more to say there than uh, expect the unexpected there for your business. And, and, and then as well as non-pandemic, right? It's you've got new competitors, uh, you've got new suppliers, the, the market dynamic changes, um, technology changes, that, that also is something from expect the unexpected. And so, you know, there's folks out there that are looking to disrupt industries at all times. And I think expect the unexpected is just a key part of running a business. Uh, you know, underspending is a is is a risk, and it, it, it's probably one of the biggest misnomers in business or small business that that we see is, um, you know, it, it's really easy for 
business owners, and, and, and this isn't just small business. I've seen it in, in the Fortune 100 companies I've been a part of uh, in my career. It, it's really easy for organizations to become hyper-focused on cost cutting and, and on driving more and more margin to the business. And what we have seen historically, uh, and we continue to see, is you've got to have a balance there and, and not spending enough, uh, you could lose that competitive edge. Uh, and, and ultimately, long term, it, it can hurt in a very big way. And so I think there is a huge balance there. But at the same time, the, the, the business owners, the small business owners, and really business owners across the board that have the mindset of, Okay, cash flow is going to drive this plan. I, I need I know I need a specific amount of margin or cash flow to run the business day to day and live, but at the same time, how am I able to drive more dollars into spending on growth? And and that could be on your people, it could be on technology, it could be on sales, on growth, uh marketing, it could be just in a lot of different ways, but but you know, being single track focused on cost cutting without really uh, making sure that you're focused on where you could spend for growth uh, it is is really detrimental or could be really detrimental to a business long term prospect. And, yeah. and then measure. And then I would say the last thing, Mike, is measuring and tracking uh, the workforce data. The more the more you're able to measure uh, and analyze and track. Uh, your data across your workforce, the, the better equipped you are to be able to make real-time decisions uh, across all of these components, right? And so I think it's regardless of what you do, uh, measuring and tracking, whether it's workforce data or, or your business data, I think I think is, is the key to making sure you're on track or where you do need to pivot and make adjustments. Yeah, I, I just had this picture in my mind of the, like previous slide we talked about, you know, uh, incremental budgeting versus zero-based it's kind of both right it's incremental that you gotta you gotta flex with you know the chain daily changes uh in, in your in your environment and marketplace and comp whether it's competitors or a pandemic uh uh you, you can't start from zero every day but you have to also have this always reevaluating our entire model uh it, 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 in thinking about not just okay 10 percent across the board cut for everybody or Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. We're just gonna. We're just gonna cut our marketing and our advertising budget, uh, uh, so I don't have to let anybody else go. Well, that might be the surest way to have to let everyone else go down the road if you're not if you're not feeding the machine, right? So, uh, really, really, really solid advice. Appreciate it. Okay, let's let's move on to our next topic, and, and this is a big one. I think we'll we'll probably park here for the rest of our conversation because each of these bullets could probably be you know a whole webinar series in and of itself. Um, I first want to kind of focus on this, you know, yellow quote from Corn Ferry in, in the bottom. Uh, you know, this, it seems almost tone deaf in a way to talk about a, a labor shortage, but we were well on our way on this path where people were feeling the labor shortage in February of 2020, you know, 11 months ago. And when this thing comes back, and it's going to, the the global demographic numbers are just too big, and they don't, they just they don't they don't lie. It's a sequencing and a timing issue. But but I want you to put some color and bring the bring this this labor shortage to life for small business businesses. This is not you know the ten thousand employee large enterprise that just has to think about these things in the macro. This is real stuff for small business owners. It is, it is, and it goes back to, you know, as I talk to small businesses every single day, um, th this is their biggest, even today, you know, it's, it's, it's finding good people and finding people that I can count on that uh, understand the business and can learn the business and perform uh, and perform well and are committed and are responsible. Uh, and are responsible employees. And, and, and again, uh, I don't, you know, I think every single person that's listening to this broadcast can attest to that, regardless of whether they're, you know, the sole proprietor or, or they've got, 
you know, a few dozen employees. It, it really is a shortage. We saw it in a very big way where you had to offer pre-COVID uh, um, a, a much higher rate of salary benefits, total compensation in order to attract uh, the, the right type of talent to your company. Uh, reg again, regardless of size. And, and so that's a very real thing. Uh, did it take a small, what I would say, uh, leg down uh, in in March? It, it, it did. Uh, but when you look at the V recovery of the employee, uh, the the unemployment rate, uh, it snapped back within one or two months, and and I think now it's you know somewhere around six and a half, six point eight percent. But but ultimately, it will get back uh, to. Uh, you know, a model or, or a market macro environment um, that's got just a massive shortage of skilled workers. It, c c so uh, again, I, I don't, I don't want to sound tone deaf and in, in, in not be uh, sensitive to the real, very, very real struggle people are, might be facing. So it might sound ironic that there is a talent land grab opportunity that probably has just a few months left in, in this in this window. Can, can you speak to the the if, if, if you've got the war chest, you've got the cash reserves to be able to to, to do it. You got you can cash flow it. Those are obviously the the minimum requirements. What this means, be, if if you can capitalize on going after some talent now and and really look hard at at your at the talent you have it, on staff versus what exists in the marketplace, because there's, there's, I'd say it's a, I mean, this is a once in my career opportunity that I, that I see, and I don't want to be unempathetic to existing employees or anything, but there is some incredible talent that is in the marketplace that probably is never going to be at this level again. It, it, you're absolutely right. And so that is the other side of the coin. So the first side is this massive shortage that we had and have the 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 event of the pandemic that that essentially uh drove uh this number or this shortage down because of how many folks uh became unemployed or or, or um uh were not did not have the ability to stay in the organizations they had uh and so now the the flip side of that coin is you have a a, a once in a I think generation opportunity uh, to capitalize on that now. And so knowing that the overall trend will not change, yes, there was a dramatic shift uh, during the pandemic, but ultimately um, the, the, the overall trend of the shortage will continue and continue in a very big way for the foreseeable future, right? And so now how do you capitalize on a lot of these skilled workers being back uh, in a what I would call job seeking or uh, in an in a in a uh, opportunity for you to attract some of these folks. Yes, you need to invest. Um, in, but at the same time, if you've got the ability to invest, if you're looking for how to grow coming out of this, you know, the most important thing to do is to attract the right talent. Uh, I would say over the next 90 days, six months, nine months, 2021, you're going to see a lot of companies recruiting uh, a lot of this talent because um, there's more visibility in the marketplace and, and, and these folks are out there uh, and that's a very big, um, and that's just a very big opportunity. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, uh, let, let's talk about the next topic here, compensation. So. Uh, you, you can read in the ebook. You know, Corn Ferry talks about it's, a, it's only one in three uh, businesses are going to be awarding salary increases in, in 2021. So uh, some important bench, benchmarking data. But I think maybe the area I want to focus more uh, uh, around comp is uh, uh, classification type, right? So with this expo absolute explosion in new business formation, that this is publicly available information. It's the it's the federal ID employment identification number the year, the EIN. 
the, in Q3, those those were seventy-seven percent. They nearly doubled. It's this like incredible hockey stick chart of how many people are forming businesses. And so you can imagine all these people got laid off. Now they're starting companies. This just this is throwing steroids on what was already a shift to a more gig economy, uh, as, as they call it. Uh, you know, flexible work, freelancers, contractors. How should how should employers be and small business owners be thinking about how to how to structure compensation and bonuses for for traditional staff? But how what other opportunities exist to t to tap into this shifting way? You know, it's, I want to say it's 57 million people now, but 36 percent of the workforce participates in some form or another of the gig economy. Yeah, and and, and I think listen, I mean, it it, it takes a ton of time for uh, organizations to fill uh, open uh, requisitions and, and that costs a lot of money. There's a lot of labor, there's a lot of money or opportunity uh, lost uh, doing that. And, and so now organizations have the ability to tap into to these freelance workers and, and there's different ways to uh, attract these folks. There's, there's great ways to uh, and process and, and ways to pay these folks. Uh, and, and a lot of times it could be an added benefit because you are able to flex up and down rather than having um, strictly full-time employees, right? Or even part-time employees. Here, you, you could get the best of both worlds with some of these freelance uh, or gig economy uh, uh, workers that are out there. At the same time, you, you got to offer uh, the right packages. And, and so to attract folks, you, you know, you got to make sure that you're offering the right type of compensation package, bonus package, or overall total comp package. Uh, and, and, and I know we'll talk a little bit about, you know, benefits, wellness, you know, some of these uh, ancillary or complementary components of total compensation that almost have become table stakes today uh, when talking to a lot of employees. <clears throat> Let's 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 go ahead and pivot and, and go there because there's this you know there's this compare contrast if you're you know the, the gig economy versus traditional employees then that requires uh, benefits uh, so we've got a lot of moving parts the shift to the gig economy uh, you've got traditional employees uh, that you know there's the traditional 50 employee uh, it, it, or greater that you know uh, the ACA Affordable Care Act says you, you by law you got to provide the benefits. Um, but there's just this real world thing going on that people are freaked out about their healthcare cost right now for obvious reasons, right? A lot of, uh, a lot of medical uh, 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 treatments, a lot of uh, healthcare services have been delayed by a full year, right? And so uh, with so much uncertainty, uh, you know, I've been reading studies where employees have this really heightened sense of anxiety about what's, how they're gonna manage their healthcare costs in, in that, and they don't care if it's working for a big company or a small company. So how, how should entrepreneurs and small businesses and mid-sized companies be thinking about the, the, all that it, 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 in the backdrop of wellness and benefits? I think now more than ever, you're hearing about, you know, employee fatigue, burnout, mental wellness. I mean, folks are working, they're, they're working hard. It's a very stressful environment. Uh, and and it, it's impacting productivity in many ways, right? And and if you think about that, and, and you take keep that sort of that framework in mind, I, I think it's important to you know really tailor the type of benefits that you're offering uh, to your employees. Uh, in, in a very specific manner, keeping those things in mind. So, so we've seen, you know, uh, organizations that are offering um, uh, uh, PTO um, that that has to be used, uh, days off that don't hit PTO. Uh, we're seeing a lot of different uh, wellness uh, programs, and there's stuff that's out there. Uh, there's different apps that are out there that organizations are uh, providing to their employees from a mental wellness, from a health and wellness standpoint. Uh, we're seeing fitness because home fitness has become uh, so big and, and that folks allocate time for that and, and actually provide services around that. Uh, and, and these are very small 
what I would say uh, costs that, that really don't have much impact uh, from an overall cost standpoint, especially when you think about, you know, on average, I think the number we saw of something, Mike, was something like 30% of the comp cost, compensation costs come from benefits, right? So you're spending right. all this money on benefits. You know, you, you, you've you got these subscription-based apps and in, in these certain things around health and wellness and fitness that are really, really small in the grand scheme of things that the value back to the employees is monumental. And we've seen that in, in, the, in the organizations that, have embraced those things and offer them to their employees, they're getting more productivity out of their folks. And then they're attracting uh, the talent that's out there that's looking for an organization that's got that sort of empathy uh, towards health and wellness. Yeah, very good. I'm going to lump together the next kind of couple of topics because uh, uh, I think I think they go hand in hand. We've been touching on this throughout our conversation here. So recruiting and onboarding, training and development, Talent management and engagement. Let, let, let's let's take those three and, and, and it, you'll see in the in the ebook that we, we go deep on each of these three topics in of themselves. But in the context of pandemic, budget, small business uh, 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 approaching growth mode here. What what what's your uh, guidance for small business owners here, uh, Al? I, I think what's what's critical is be be very aware of remote and and when you think about recruiting talent management, uh, the landscape has changed. Remote working is here. Uh, it's been here. The acceleration I think is showing and proving that it, it, it's here to stay. So keep that in mind as you think about uh, the the folks you're recruiting, the folks you're retaining, and what you put out there from a training and development curriculum. Uh, that ensures that remote workers feel plugged in, feel a part of something, uh, and, and that the, that communication is there with remote workers. That's really important to keep in mind as you, what I would say, look at a training and development curriculum um, uh, for the organization. Uh, from from a from a compliance administration and technology. I mean, ultimately, you know. Unless you're in the compliance business, unless you're in the you know human capital administration business, uh, your core competency is running your business. And so we don't have enough hours of the day. And, and again, when I talk to small business owners specifically on their biggest challenge outside of finding good talent, it's, you know, there's not enough time in the day. And, and not having enough time in the day um, I, I, I think is a testament to what can I outsource and how do I make sure I am in compliance? How do I make sure that I can administer and offer all these benefits? How can I make sure that I've got the right uh, technology to measure my workforce and, and, and my, my greatest investment uh, without spending hours every day and every week doing on that? doing that and focusing on my business and growing my business, right? So to me, those are probably the most important aspects as you sort of bring it together on, um, you know, a business owner's view of attracting, developing, and, and measuring and making sure you're in compliance and offering uh, all the greatest things to your employees. Yeah, I, I just got to add, I, I think probably one of the... This has obviously been a continuum to shift to virtual flexible, uh, flexible work. Uh, th th this is, shift has been going on for a couple decades, right? Um, in in this been the, the shift has been accelerating, and then the pandemic was obviously a gigantic accelerator. <clears throat> I would just encourage uh, business owners to to think about this as more than a way to. This is not. There, there's a labor. Uh, there, excuse me. There's a real estate arbitrage play. There's a hey more flexible um, uh, uh, work environments uh, means more uh, engaged employees. The data is really clear on that. There's that play, but the the talent pool. I mean, if you just think about if you're a, if you're a, a small high school uh, with you know 250 students, hard to field a competitive uh, 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 football team, right? If you're a mega school with 5,000 students across a big campus, you can produce a football 
powerhouse just because your talent pool is so much larger. You just pick the biggest kids out, right? Uh, it's the same thing for small businesses. When geography doesn't matter and, and you have the ability to work virtual, uh, the, the number of people that are truly special in your really unique field field of, uh, of work, uh, the, the, the talent game changes dramatically. Let, let's, let's, let's bring it home, Al. I know we're, we're getting close on time. Um, you know, uh, we're at an inflection point uh, uh, for, with, with the, uh, the government, right? So there's obviously, there's more HR legislation passed in 2020 than probably the prior decade with, you know, FFCRA and CARES, uh, and that, those are just the, the, the federal, uh, at the federal level, the, the changes in, in healthcare policies uh, uh, at the local, you know, the, the, the mayoral, the, the county, the state level, uh, you kind of just leave your head spinning here, but uh, I, I think safe to say, uh, and that, you know, we're not taking any sides, red state, blue state uh, at all, but it's reasonable to expect when you have one party controlling uh, both Congress, uh, both houses of Congress the, uh, and the presidency, there's gonna be policies that get through, they're gonna be pushed through with probably uh, maybe even <laughs> as much as 2020, if not, if not more. Um, how, how do you guide uh, small business owners to to keep up with it and stay not, not only take advantage of opportunities but to stay compliant? Well, I, I, I think the good news is, like we chatted about, or, or one of my comments was, you know, tech technology is out there, right? And and so you don't need to do this with an abacus anymore and in a notebook and and um, spend hours during the day of your day or your work week doing it. Uh, there's technology out there that streamlines this, that, that really uh, gives you the ability to uh, manage this, control this, uh, really from anywhere and, and from any device these days. And, and that's pretty amazing, right, where technology has come. So I think look to technology um, to really ease the burden on the compliance and the administration side. <clears throat> yeah, and that, and that goes from... Ser to services to tools, right? I mean, you don't have to keep track of 11,000 taxing jurisdictions. You don't have to keep track of the never never changing uh, laws when, when there are tools, platforms, service providers to, to do that for you. Uh, Al, really good conversation today. A anything else you'd wanna wanna add or, or wisdom you'd wanna part uh, with, with, our, with our audience today? I think no, Mike. I, I really enjoyed it and appreciate uh, being a part of it. And 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 look, from from my standpoint, uh, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for small businesses out there. We're seeing it in the business formation numbers uh, that that are really amazing when you look at uh, just in the third quarter alone the the amount of business formations versus. Uh, how many business formations happened the prior 12 months, which was a growing economy uh, prior to COVID. And so we know that people, small business owners specifically, are out there and see an opportunity. Uh, and so if you keep that in mind, if you plan, if you understand that your people are your biggest asset and, and really the ticket and the key uh, for success and growth, if you keep those things in mind, I think it's going to be a, a, an amazing year and, and an amazing trajectory for small businesses uh, in the United States and frankly, across the globe. Yeah, very good. All right, so to recap, uh, the, the, we, we were unpacking the, and put some color commentary around their latest ebook, HR and Payroll Budgeting and Planning. Hop on our website to, to download it, uh, share uh, as you desire. Uh, and as always, uh, if we can help, we'd love to. Uh, sure, human capital management uh, is a suite of payroll and tax, time and attendance, HR and HR services suite uh, that we, we help small businesses grow, specifically our 60,000 small businesses, help them stay compliant, save money, and grow their business. So, Ale, thank you so much. Thank you for everybody else attending, and we look forward to talking to everybody next week. Thanks, Mike.